How we doing, One Church family? You guys all right? Come on, it's great to have you here. My name is Blake and I'm the lead pastor. I want to welcome everybody in the house today. A lot of people um, slept in because of the time change. It was really cold. So nobody was at the nine o'clock, even though we've like begged you to come to the nine. And like, everybody's like, nope, not doing it. So anyways, man, it is fantastic to have you. If you're new around here, man, we just hope you feel right at home already. If you're new online and watching us um, because of time change and it's cold, it's okay. We love you. But the people that are here, God loves more. I just want you to know that. No, I'm playing. It really is an honor. No matter, we had just, I just found out somebody from North Carolina is joining us. Hi, it's good to have you. And uh, people all over the world are watching us online. We just thank you for being a part of us, okay? So um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a grandpa and my name is Bam Bam. And because I have a new grandbaby, um, occasionally I just want to show my sweet Ellie Blake off. My sweet wife went down to Florida to see her. And so here's a couple of pictures of my little Ellie. She has, um, we counted yesterday, she was eating some peas or something and she has five little fat rolls. She's just a chunky little thing and just absolutely adorable. So um, there's no reason at all to show you that other than uh, I'm a pastor and I can do what I want. So um, it's great, great to have you. Um, I, I want to tell you I'm really excited about this series. God's doing some special place. Uh, we're in week two of a series called Baggage. And if you didn't get a chance to watch last week, it was a really powerful message. And I encourage you to go back and watch that. Um, today, I, I want to talk about the fact that every one of us have a past, right? We, we, we all have a past, and a lot of us have things in our past that we're not very proud of, things that we've done that uh, create shame and guilt and regret. And we have a tendency to sort of relive those things and rehash them, and maybe way too much, ponder them. And, and a lot of people, um, it's very destructive to relive things that have happened that are really hard. And so it's, it's easy to accumulate junk while we're here, right? We're just passing through aliens and strangers that are here for just a moment. And yet while we're here, we have a tendency, if we aren't careful, to pick up the wrong things and to be weighted down uh, while, while we're here. And we have bags that are sometimes filled with garbage and stuff that's just like, you, you don't need to carry that. And for some of us, um, it's like a, a thousand small things. It's like, you know, things that aren't really that big of a deal, but it's like we still carry it. And it's like, you know, stuff like selfishness or um, maybe arrogance or pride and things that are a big deal, but it's not like super, super heavy. Things that we go, man, I, I partied a lot when I was young and, um, and maybe it's things that are, are like that. But then there's others of us that have things that are really heavy things that make it feel like it seems impossible to overcome them. Th things like divorce or maybe something that happened to you and there's years of abuse that, that has caused you to have all kinds of baggage and maybe for you it's the weight of an abortion and, and things that just seem impossible. And I think that as a pastor, it's important for me to, to say, hey, we need to talk, we need to talk about those things. Can we have honest conversation where we can be vulnerable and raw about some of our own pain and things that we're really walking through and things that we want to hide because we think that if you knew, you'd be disgusted with me and you'd walk away. And so I, I think that we need to have a kind of a church where there's open conversation about the things that are the heaviest in our lives. We don't need to be a place, even though sometimes it seems like Peachtree City is like all shiny, pretty, and plastic, and I'm fine, it's great, you know, we just sh shove things away instead. I wanna be a place where, where you realize we're, we're brothers and we're sisters in Christ, and it's okay uh, to not be okay. And we talk about things that um, might not feel safe to say out loud. Well, you can hear, you can hear. And so um, I, my prayer is that we would take some time to unpack some worthless weight and learn to live free and travel light. There's a great book by Max Lucado that's actually called Traveling Light. And it's a, it's a great book if you're wanting to have something to go along with this series. 
But he has a quote where he says, odds are you have luggage in your hands right now. Somewhere between our first step out of bed this morning and your last step out the door, you picked up some overstuffed bags. You stepped over to the baggage carousel and you just loaded up. You don't remember doing so? Well, that's because you did it without thinking. Don't remember seeing the baggage terminal? That's because the carousel is not the one in the airport. It's the one that's in your mind. And the bags we grab are not made of leather, they're made of burdens. The suitcase is guilt. It's a sack of discontentment. You drape a duffel bag of weariness on the shoulder and a hanging bag of grief on the other and add on a backpack of doubt, an overnight bag of loneliness and a trunk of fear. And pretty soon you're juggling more luggage than a sky cap. No wonder you're so tired at the end of the day Carrying all that baggage is exhausting. Here's what I know. If we allow our past to paralyze us, then we don't get to step into a really great future that the Father has for us. It's really easy to get stuck there, isn't it? It's easy to say, man, I, 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 I don't know how to get past this. And I, as a pastor, I've talked to a lot of people who don't ever seem to get past their past to actually really move on. See, let me say it like this. If we live in our history, then we won't step into our destiny. If you missed last week, there's a couple of nuggets that I want you to get. And one of them is from Philippians 3, where it says, forget what is behind and strain towards what's ahead. See, please, please hear me. Maybe, maybe you are a product of your past, but listen, you don't have to be a prisoner to it. That's good right there. That's some preaching. Re remember what I said last week. If, if you don't let your past die, then it won't let you live. So we've got to figure out, like how do, I, how do I break the chains? How do I set myself and be free from the pain of our past and, and allow it not to kill us and crush us and destroy us? We live in a world that's at war. Do you guys know that? There's a battle that's raging on right this very second. And the battle is for um, my devotion. The whole battle for all of humanity, is over your worship. It's over connection and intimacy with the Father and with one another. And so we, we have to recognize that we're, we're, we're in this battle and we have to recognize that, hey, we're just temporarily here and there is an enemy of darkness. He, he's actually the prince of the air and his name is Satan. And he is opposed to everything that God is. He hates holiness. He loves darkness. He, he it, it is, it feels exposed when he's in the light, so he hates it. And so do all of his followers, by the way. They hate being in the light. And so you try to give them the light, and that's why there's rebellion and rivalry, and there's chaos and confusion, because darkness hates the light. And you say, Blake, why did, why did God create hell? Because some people want to be there. Actually, if you think about God's love, it's very loving of God to not make people that love darkness to be in the light. So that's a good way to think of hell. It's like it's a place where there's a separation. Hell is very real. And there will be this, you know, goats and sheep that will go one way or the other. Light and darkness will be split apart. In, at one point in history, God's going to be done with all this chaos and he's going to come back to planet earth. Does anybody believe that? He's going to come riding on a cloud and there's going to be a trumpet sound and the king of kings and lord of lords will be tattooed on his thigh and he will say, come on home, it's over. And for now though, we have to recognize I'm in a battle and the enemy of darkness is utterly evil and his greatest goal is for the children of God to remain in bondage to our sin. 
He wants us to stay a slave, shackled and bound up, exhausted from our baggage. So recognize that your mind is a battlefield. Recognize that the war is right here. And this is where you win or lose. Where, where mental and spiritual warfare is taking place right now. Our flesh and our spirit are opposed to one another. There's this war going on inside of each of us. And every person that walked in this door is going, man, I, I've got to fight harder for the, for the truth. I've got to believe. I've got to have faith. I've got to work my way towards becoming a follower of Jesus so that I can find my calling and do what my purpose and plan is here on planet Earth. But the enemy the whole time is saying, no, you don't. Don't worry about that. It's not a big deal, right? And so what does he do? What does he do? While, while we're here, he wants us devoted to the things of this world. And he's sly about it. It's slick. It's small things. It's things you go, I don't, I don't, it's not that big of a deal. Let me say it like this. I say this to my kids. The enemy doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. Come on. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Let's all say that. Come on. Mm. You ready? Yeah, that's good. Enemy doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. Listen, if he can keep us distracted, then he will neutralize you. Or, or even worse, he loves to turn our distractions into addictions, which leads to self-destruction. So today, I'd like to take that thought one step further and say it like this. If you don't destroy your distractions, your distractions will destroy you. They have the potential, don't they? So, so this talk today, I'm calling it Destroy Your Distractions. I said it with some soul. Destroy your distractions. In fact, say this with me. Say, it's time to destroy my distractions. Mm. <laughs> that was good. The Bible has a lot to say about life's distractions. Paul said it like this to the first Corinthian church. Um, to the Corinthian church, not the first one. But anyways, he said it in first Corinthians chapter 7. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. I love how Solomon brilliantly said something similar in Proverbs chapter four. He says, set your gaze on the path before you with a fixed purpose. Looking straight ahead, ignore life's distractions. The definition for distraction is to direct away. It's a divided devotion, an agitated mind sent in different directions or mental distress. How many here would say that focus is a fight? Focus is a fight. One time I heard a pastor uh, say that anytime I was struggling to focus and my wife needed to get my attention, she'd go like this. And so when he, he'd see his wife do this, he'd be like, oh, sorry, paying attention. That's so dumb, but it worked <laughs> for them. So I, I got to tell you, focus, man. For me, I, I'm paid to give like 20 to 30 hours a week sitting down in front of a computer to focus and pay attention and it takes extreme focus to write an eight-page paper that I get to come and deliver every single week, and you guys all judge me on that paper. <laughs> and so, man, it, it takes an incredible focus for me to spend that much time every week devoted to teaching the truth of the Scriptures. And I know all of us in this day and age, man, it's a very real battle. I, I, I want to ignore distractions, I really do. I want to have as few distractions as possible, right? So I turn off my notifications. I, I tell my kids, do not come in here. But then they come in and I'm really glad they do because I get lonely. <laughs> and so I, I, I think that all of us, when we have so many screens, we have you know all these options to entertain our mind, don't we? Things that constantly bombard us. And I feel like, I feel like my mind, I feel like this is true for a lot of people. We have mental fatigue, right? 
attention atrophy. It's called foggy brain. We're weary and we're, there's constant dings and rings. And some people actually call it the buzzing brain. It's like a high-pitched thing in our head all the time. But I, I know that this really matters. That attention and focus is life or death. I, I know that I have to pay attention to what I'm paying attention to. And, and I know that all I really have in this life is my cognitive ability to, to listen to the Father and to process what he said, to think about it, and spend time focusing on what he's wanting to say to me, to write it down, and to grow from what he's trying to change inside of me. That's it. To know God and to make him known. That's it. And the greatest illusion that the enemy of darkness has is to capture our attention. He says, hey, hey, hey don't pay attention to that. Hey, look over here. Hey, right? That's what he does constantly. That's his job. And, and he wants us to focus on things that don't matter at all. And, and the Bible calls that idolatry. It's when, you know, you're here and here's God and there's anything in between that's trying to get your distraction. It's, it's an idol. And I don't, I don't want that. I, I don't want to be double-minded. I want to be single-minded, right? Focused on what God has for me. Wholehearted fixed on my purpose, laser focused on the one thing that matters the most. That's to love God and to love his people, right? That's it. And so that's the last thing that Satan wants. He does not want me to be that focused. Because the more I'm walking in the spirit, you better watch out. Light is exposing darkness and people are set free by the power of Christ inside of me because we're the hope of glory, right? You're a dwelling place of the living God. And so when we're focused and walking in the spirit, woo, all of hell, all of the demonic forces want to destroy our devotion and fight for our worship and discourage our faith in Jesus. So what does he do? He distracts us. That's what he does. Every day, he distracts us. He wants our devotion divided. He wants our minds to be indecisive, cloudy. He, he wants us um, not sober-minded, right? Right? He wants us drunk on things that don't matter. He wants us confused and out of focus. James was serious about this. He called it being double-minded and unstable in all we do. Whoa, bro, come on. Really? I don't want to be unstable in all that I do. So can I ask you a question today? This is real. It's important. Are there hidden things in your life that are distracting you from your calling and your purpose? Have you concealed things, right, you're covering up that are actually killing you and they're crushing you and possibly destroying you? Eventually, can I tell you, church, as your pastor, that those distractions will have to be dealt with. At some point, you're going to be found out. So you might as well Go before the Father and maybe before some close friends and your accountability and, and confess it and be healed from it. I don't want you to carry it. Let it go. Find freedom. That's what, that's what your Savior wants to do. He wants to take those burdens. In fact, it says in Mark 4, for whatever is hidden is meant to be what? Disclosed. And whatever is what? Concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Have you ever done something and you immediately thought, I can't believe I just did that and you wanted to hide? This week, I went to go play golf with my son, Luke, and we were on hole number, I shouldn't tell you the hole, never mind. We were at Braylon. Somebody in here knows this hole, so I'm not saying the hole. We were at Braylon. It was a very nice, upstanding, you know, golf course and, you know, very nice homes. I take my son Luke to play at this nice place. And he hits a ball and shanks it hard to the right and it hits a house. And it was so loud you could hear it from miles around. It's like it hit this shed and I just wanted to crawl in a hole. And I was like, I can't take you anywhere. Right? And so I just wanted to hide. One of the things that I used to say to my daughters when they'd come home from being a teenager, they were teenagers and they'd come home and when they'd get, this is a great um, 
uh, tactic, if you're a father of teenagers, by the way, they'd, they'd come in, in the house and they'd sit down and I'd be sitting there and I'd say, hey, listen, um, I heard what happened. <laughs> Brilliant. I'd just sit there quiet, look at them in their soul, look at them like, and then <laughs> I'd say, do, do you want to tell me about it? And they go, uh, what? Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think I did anything wrong, Dad. <laughs> and I'd be like, no, is that, is that your, what you want to say? You know that I know. Just, just say it, baby. <laughs> did not. <laughs> Oh, and they're, they're like, Dad, I was, uh, I'm just kidding. Um, I have another story of a time that I just wanted to, you know, hide and crawl underneath the table. I was um, in Oklahoma. I was at Brahms. Can I get a shout out for Brahms? We got some Oklahoma people, yeah. And so they have the very best burgers and Rocky Road shakes in the world. And so I was on a job site with my, my boss, Earl Stewart. Earl was a missionary. And he actually um, had come back from off the field and he was now, uh, had a roofing company and I had the privilege to work for him. Very conservative man. And, um, and <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we were in line and um, we were ordering and I realized I don't have any money. And so I lied to Earl and I said, man, I, I've got to go to the bathroom. We really, right across the street was bank. And so I was going across the street to get money real fast because it was a really long line. I was like, I'll be able to go get money and come back because I knew that if I said, I don't have any money, but I'll pay. I didn't want that. So I ran across the street to get money. And then I, I rushed back. And when I came back, um, I realized the line was completely gone. And I walked up to the cashier and she said, uh, the guy you were with paid for your order. And I was like, oh, great. So I went and sat down by myself in a stall. Well, Earl went to the bathroom. And there was one man that was on the toilet. And Earl starts going, good Lord, it stinks in here. <laughs> My land, you smell awful. He's saying this, this poor fellow. <laughs> <in the> stall. <laughs> so, <laughs> He washes his hands, takes the paper towel, and he chunks it over the stall at this poor man. And then he comes walking out, and he sees me, he's like, what are you doing? And he like scoots into the seat real fast. And he looks at me and he goes, you said you were going to the bathroom. I said, I, I know, I was like a thing. And I'm, he goes, I just, um, <laughs> I told this man he smelled awful and I, I made fun of how bad he stinks and, and then I took a paper towel and I threw it at him and I was like, what have you done? And he goes, he goes, I'm taking my shoes off. And he's like, he's, he's had to see my shoes and he hit his shoes on. Oh, that's so stupid, but that's what he did. And so I'm just saying, eventually all of our sins will be found out. And we're going to be laid bare before our maker. And he's going to smell our stinkage or something. I don't know. So, so again, James said there's healing in our confession. So I want us as a church to not carry it, like to let go of it and to get rid of whatever's bogging us down so that we can walk in freedom. Our, our Abba Father, he's serious about this. He loves you and he, he doesn't want you, you know, weighted down with sin and darkness. In fact, he wants us fully devoted in worship to him alone. He's a jealous God and he doesn't want to share you with the rest of the things that are distracting you. He's saying, I focus. And you pay attention, like I've got a job for you that's really serious, and you're here to wage war, and you're my, you're my 
soldier. And I've got to send you out to fight. And this is no joke. He wants us to live a life that's 100%, like focused on our eternal purposes. Because he's a good father and he, he wants to talk tenderly to us, his children. And he wants us to hear the promptings that he's speaking and whispering. And so we have to pay attention. We have to have ears to hear and eyes to see and listen for the movement of his spirit on the earth right now. He needs us, the church, more than ever. There's, there's, the population is you know, more than yesterday. I don't know if you knew that. Because of that, like the last 100 years, it's gone from like you know, 2 billion to 8 billion. So I think that our responsibility on planet Earth right now is more than ever before. And so we have to take our calling seriously. So, so Satan, he wants us to be distracted. He wants to combat that. He, d- he wants us off mission. He wants to take us off of the path. So we have to pay attention to his crafty schemes that he's really good at. He's slick at making us distracted. He, have you ever noticed that when you're trying to go to church, like, Seriously, like all of hell breaks loose. Like you're trying to get in the car and your kids decide to start throwing boogers at each other and yelling and screaming. And all of a sudden there's like, you know, you're, you're, the room's trash and all, well, you don't know why you're bickering with your spouse. And then you're like, <laughs> just like this snippy at each other. And you walk in the door, I'm fine, yeah. What the heck? Or, or like when you sit down to pray, right? And you're trying to like, you know, spend time with God and talk to him and read the Bible. It's like all of a sudden, what happened? Like, oh, there's just chaos, confusion. Oh, my, my phone's blown up and people are trying to, always, right? I feel that war. When I'm trying to write a sermon, he doesn't want me to get up here and do this. He doesn't want me to speak the truth about people being set free from them. So what is he doing? He's like, hey, Blake, hey, Blake, always. And I, I gotta pay attention to it, man. I've gotta recognize he's, he's scheming to try and, to, the devil wants us focused on ridiculous things that do not matter. Like Gilmore Girls, Montana. <laughs> oh, that hurt, didn't it? <laughs> or how many hearts and likes we can get on social media, let's be honest, right? You get obsessed with our posts and we're like going, oh man, so many people follow. And then you get stuck just going, oh my, bing, bing, like, right, right. And the enemy loves jealousy and envy. So he wants us looking at all of our friends and be like, wow, their life is so much better than mine. I just am pitiful and they're great and I'm not. He loves us to do that. Just constant comparison. He, he loves that. Can I remind you, I said this not too long ago, that social media, think about that term. Media is singular for Medium. And what's a medium? A medium does witchcraft. It's demonic and it's satanic. And mediums get on the television so they can tell us their vision. And what do they send that through? Channels. Come on. Amen. And those channels are what? They're, they're sending out through this cast because they're casting a spell. And it's a broadcast to capture everybody in social media. I'm just saying. Are we thinking about, like, what, how is he doing it? Oh, maybe it's through my phone. Yeah, that's true. I've seen hell on my phone. I've seen hell through my TV. I've seen people be completely distorted and twisted. Their whole self-image and their whole worldview is shaped by Hollywood. And we all know Hollywood is filled with pedophilia and darkness, and, right? Am I just making stuff up or is this truth? And so it's not all bad. Of course there's good. There's, there's things that are, we can use it as a tool. I recognize that. And we do at this church. And people are watching online right now that are being ministered to. I, I believe it can be used for good. But I also believe I have to pay close attention to hell. And so... Mm. Maybe for you, it's, it's um, uh, recognizing that I'm obsessed with sports. Well, how is the enemy distracting? Where? Are, are you watching? It, maybe it's the stock market and you're obsessed with your bank account and it's money. Maybe for you, it's, it's politics 
and you're charged and ticked off. And I'm telling you right now, the enemy loves to divide us. And he wants us to be divided over things we can't control. So really what he wants to do is steal our peace and replace it with mental distress. That's what he wants to do. In our marriage, in our friendships, in your calling, that's what he wants to do. Another thing the enemy wants to do is to destroy your identity. He doesn't want you to know who you are. He doesn't wa want you walking in the power of the Almighty God. He, he doesn't want us to recognize that, man, I, I am the hope of glory because Christ really is in me. He doesn't want you to really believe that. And he doesn't want you to know that you're actually, you're, you're a child of the King of Kings. That you're, you belong to the creator of the world who has all authority and all dominion over the earth and over him. He doesn't want you to know that. Um, what, what if we actually believe that was true? One of my daughter's best friends, her name is Josie, and she walks around and believes that. She actually walks in a building and she'll say to herself as she's walking in, no matter where it is, she walks in and says, my dad owns this place. Dad's the owner. And when you, when you walk and believe that, you know what happens? Your thinking changes. You're like, they're gonna be, they're gonna be glad to see me. And I'm, I'm on mission. And some people are walking in darkness and I've got a job to do to expose, expose and speak truth. And not just that, I matter and I'm important and my voice needs to be heard right now. What if we walked everywhere, we went, my dad owns the place. Because it's true, actually. So the, the, the enemy wants us with our head down, wants our hands full, head down, hands full, discouraged, defeated, deflated. He, he wants us to not be able to work because we have too much in our hands. So busy, you know, I recently said to someone, busy is an acronym that stands for being under Satan's yoke. And we pride ourselves, on, how are you doing? I'm so busy, man. I'm busier than I can, I just can't be busier. Wow, that's, you're proud of that. I want to be footloose and fancy free. I, I want people to be able to walk into my office, my staff, any of you in my church, and be able to, to walk in and I, 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 people are never a distraction. People are our business. People are the purpose, right? If you're here for just this long, every moment matters and every discussion, every conversation needs to be directed by God. So when people walk in my door, shut my computer and say, shut up, look who's here. Come on, baby, sit down. I can't wait to talk with you. I try. I'm not always great at that. But I think we should live that way, right? Where we say, I, I, I want to be, uh, I don't want to walk around defeated, deflated, and devalued. So we have to pay attention, and we can't be distracted by the destructive words and lies of the great accuser. You know that's his job? That he's got a really crooked finger, and he loves to point at you all the time and say, you know what you did. You know. You know what you did. You know, you're, you can't be used by God. He loves to have those whispers. He loves to tell you what you're not. He loves to make sure you're defined by your sin and to stay there, pinned down, because you did that thing. So does anybody know that the enemy is the great accuser? Revelation 12 is if you're looking for it. And it actually says that his job day and night, day and night, day and night, he has one job. You know what that is? To accuse the brethren, accuse the brothers and sisters, and to constantly throw shade, right? Jesus felt this all the time. Has anybody ever been accused of something before? Where you're like, you know, somebody was questioning your motives and saying things about your heart and pointing fingers at you? It's awful. Nobody likes to feel that, like, why are you accusing me? I, I didn't do it, right? Like my daughter's coming home. <laughs> Like there's something about feeling accused that's like, man, I, I just can't stand accusers. When you're accusing someone, you're being a lot like your father, Lucifer. 
Can I say that? Uh, he's an adversary, and he actually is not for us, he's against us. And he takes us to heavenly court and serves in a prosecutu prosecutorial role. Hard word, big word, I get extra points. Um, Jesus had all kinds of people that did this. They would dishonor him and disrespect him and constantly question him. And there's this incredible account in John 8, actually all of John 8, I'd encourage you to read it this week. Because it's, it's like learning how to face your accusers and to combat your accusers. He tells them who they really are with boldness and authority. And what they're doing is they're, they're heckling. They're, they're a distraction to Jesus' calling. And he turns and he says, man, I'm going to tell you what's up, sucker. He doesn't tiptoe, right? He doesn't back down. He, he steps up with authority and he says something that's like, what did you just say? Uh, bro, check this out. John 8, 44, he says, you belong to your father, the devil. <laughs> you ever said that to your boss? <laughs> or your spouse? No, don't, don't nudge him right now. <laughs> you know you called me the devil the other day. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Then he says, he was a murderer. And from the beginning, he was not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. What? Hey, can I talk to you about your daddy? Your daddy's a liar, and he's a murderer. And when he's lying, that's his native tongue. Just like you, bro. Wow. Man, he told me I'm, I'm a child of the devil, that, that's what he said. That, that is bold. That's not playing around. And maybe, maybe for some of you, it's time for you to look at your distractions and to put them in their place. Maybe it's time for you to stand up and to say, I'm not going to take this anymore because I know who I am and I know whose I am. I know my identity, I know where I belong, and my dad's in control of all of this, and hold up, wait a minute, you're, you're telling lies, and I don't believe it. Maybe it's time for some of us to ask God to show us, Lord, what are my distractions? What's destroying me? Maybe, maybe it is a lack of self-control. Maybe it is pride. Maybe it is time to say, uh, God, what lies am I listening to? What agreements am I making in my heart and believing that I need to let go of? That I've been told by someone else or told by, by my friends and family that it's close to me, or maybe I've told it to myself and I've just taken it on and I believe it. See, maybe, maybe it's time to ask God to help us stop dwelling on the things of this world and to set our gaze and our path on what he has for us and get serious about fulfilling our calling. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. How many people came in this room today and all you've been obsessed with are your troubles? Anybody? What you see in the physical, anybody? What we see, it's happened in Ukraine, anybody? Now, is there things and troubles that are on you right now that that's what you're looking at? What we can see now in the physical? He says, rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. You guys believe that? Because I don't know if you know this, but we're here for one purpose, and that's for connection. Connection. Connection with God and connection with one another. And you can't see it, but you know when it's there, right? There's this force, energy, something. It's called love. And love's invisible. Trust, invisible. Joy, invisible. You can't see it. But it's the most powerful thing on the planet. And so maybe it's time for some of you to recognize there's been a distraction. 
I'm here to connect with God and I can't because I have sin. And sin is destroying me and it's causing a disconnection from the Father. That's what sin does. It causes consternation in our spirit. Something's broken and I can't seem to... Can I say something? When I'm walking in sin, you know the first person to notice? My sweet bride. She's like, hey, what's up? She knows. Disconnection is usually caused by darkness that we've allowed in. And so I just want to challenge you today to get serious about what you're connecting to and also get serious about what's distracting you from that connection. Maybe it's time, like me, to look at things in the past, people in the past, and to actually turn around and face the wolves that have been chasing you. And to recognize what they really are and tell them who they are. And maybe it's time to actually speak the truth boldly to your accusers and to not be ashamed of your past, but to walk like you actually belong to God not in fear, not in intimidation, but with love and justice, with grace and truth, speaking to the people that are trying to destroy you. And maybe it's time to work towards resolve and fight for reconciliation, not necessarily for their healing, but for yours. You guys realize that's how it works. Do you know that? When we forgive people, You're the one that's set free. We, you might say, Blake, man, I I can't forgive them because if I do that, then, then they win. If I forgive them, then I'm the doormat and they walked on me and they, they, they got the trump card. And I'd say back then, then you know what? You're losing. You're losing. If you're holding on to that, I'm telling you, You, you hold on to unforgiveness, clearly you don't understand the power that happened on the cross. Jesus became our doormat, didn't he? He actually died as a ransom. He, he's our advocate in the heavenly courts that says, hold up, before you say those things about him and her, don't you realize that they're my kid and I covered them with my blood and they've been washed and they're completely forgiven. They're completely f- pure. God advocates on our behalf. He, 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 he paid a ransom with his very life because he believes in the word forgiveness and grace, unmerited favor that he put on us. He blessed us to let us know you are completely clean because what, what What does unforgiveness give you? Because some of you like holding on to it so dearly. Every day you pick it back up. Unforgiveness, right? Bitterness. You pick it back up. What does it give you? Because it's serving a purpose or you would let it go. For some reason you, you hold on to it like an old shoe you want to put back on. But, but can I just tell you that I, I know what it gives you actually. It gives you baggage. It gives you burdens. It weight that keeps you hindered from actually being able to move and go and serve and love. Unforgiveness can be simply understood as a distraction. And so Isaiah 43 says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Because see, see, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. And you know what that new thing, it's springing up. Do you, do you not perceive it? Look around. Look around, church. We have two more baptisms in about five minutes. Do you, do you not perceive there's a new thing that's springing up? And he says, I'm making a way in the wilderness. I moved to Georgia because I believed God was going to take dry land and he was going to be a geyser that's going to explode and make a way in the streams in the wasteland. We're watching it happen right here at this. It's a miracle what's happening at this church. 
How? How? Why, why has it gone from 200 to 1,000 in 19 last weekend, which is a record? The attendance, because God's favor, His blessing, His anointing is on this house. Because, because there's streams in the wasteland. God is doing a new thing and He wants to do it in your life right now if you'll let Him. He will make a whole new way where there seems to be no way. Streams in your wasteland. Don't allow the distractions of this world to destroy you. He can't, we can't continue to let fear and anxiety cripple us. We have to tell ourselves who we really are because we know whose we really are. Speak life over yourself. Walk in confidence because you are a child of the Creator God. Don't give guilt and regret a voice. Don't listen to dread. Don't give up. And don't lose heart. And don't back down. If God's given you a vision or a dream, be ruthless about it. Stay focused on it. My dad used to say to me, Blake, sorry, don't let anything or anyone stand in the way of your calling. If it's the Father, you do what He said. Way before you do what I said. You do what the Father says. And you know what? Have confidence. Walk in. And if you feel like it's a ministry you're supposed to do at a church or you're supposed to do with somebody else, you make them tell you no. Go in, ask. Make them tell you no. In other words, don't talk yourself out of it before you go and do it. Step into it. He's got a path for you. He'll tell you, don't believe the lies that God doesn't want to use you. Because if you're not dead, then God's not done. He has a plan and a purpose right now today. So church, stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. And destroy your distractions before they destroy you. Father God, we come to you today weighted and burdened and heavy sin throughout this week, maybe, maybe this morning. And so we confess it before you. We ask for healing. We surrender our burdens and our baggage to you right now. And in the name of Jesus, I pray throughout this house and whoever's watching online would be set free. I pray right now that the bondage and the chains would break off. The shackles would no longer be there. That any, any kind of stronghold that's in people's life, I pray in the name of Jesus, you would bring it down and tear it apart. Because that's what you do, God. You set people free. And we ask for that right now in this house. We pray, Father, that if there's anything that's causing people to live under the dominion of darkness, any demonic activity in the name of Jesus, we bind you. You have no place in this house. We are children of the Most High God. And we walk in His favor and His blessing. And we, we are filled with the power of His Spirit. And we love His Word. And we don't sway to the right or to the left. We aren't distracted. We're wholly devoted, wholehearted, and singular in our purpose. So Father, direct our paths. Direct our paths, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that if anybody's here that doesn't know you, that you, you draw them to yourself right now. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving heaven and dying on a cross so that we could be completely forgiven and saved. You are our Savior who ransomed us, who advocates for us, and you've made us pure, and so one day we'll be in eternity with you. But let us not forget that there's one job that we can't do when we get to heaven, and that's to evangelize to tell people about you while we're here. So Lord, may we know you more and make you known. May we love you more and love your people. Father, put us on mission and help us be about our Father's business. Lord Jesus, we love you. We give you our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we ask, Lord, you'd use us. Help our minds today to stay focused and help us to destroy our distractions. In the name dead. Amen.